And joining us via Skype is Michael Joyce, a South African Reserve Bank shareholder. We have our Sheikh Kwane, National Black Business Caucus CEO. Good evening to both our guests. And we'll start with you, Mr. Joyce, uh, so that we don't lose uh, the line. Uh, just in your view on how South Africa would be able to um, dismantle or wean itself off uh, the rating agencies and the, the, the dependence on uh, foreign loans, etc., as in a form of credit, if we have a developmental agenda to look after. Thank you very much, Joe. I just have to add that actually it's quite an uh, interesting topic that the Reserve Bank issued a statement that they created a South African Foreign Exchange Subcommittee because actually that's one of the problems uh, for the whole rating agency issue is the South African Reserve Bank because not many people know that they sold down the foreign exchange down the road through entering the CLS system. It's a bank, it's called Continuous Linked Settlement System. It was done from Ian Plenderleith, a former Bank of England governor who was an also deputy governor of the Reserve Bank for a few years and his job was actually to achieve this which was done in December 2004 when the Reserve Bank then got the South African Rand into the settlement system which is currently 18 currencies worldwide owned by 79 shareholders and you just have to understand the magnitude of the transaction volume there. Last year there were 11 trillion dollars a day in foreign exchange transactions and it's out of control for the Reserve Bank because it's only done by those shareholders which the Reserve Bank is not but everybody of those shareholders of the CLS Bank which is based in New York has actually an account with the Reserve Bank and that is a problem for the ups and downs in the currency and that's the thing where the ANC has to shed, lead or shed some light on and understand it because that is the real problem because when you think about the South African GDP of being like 300 billion dollars uh, compared to 11 trillion in currency transactions in one day, of which the South African rand is an integral part, is one of 18 currencies, and the Reserve Bank is just a bystander and watching what the commercial banks are doing. That is a problem, and that's also the reason for the callback of Nene and the nationalization debate in the in the uh, parliament last week, because actually the rating agencies will definitely would have downgraded South Africa because they have to put pressure on them to keep them going, because the RAND is actually responsible for sub-Saharan Africa, because all the SEDEC countries, all the 17 SEDEC countries are traded through the Reserve Bank, through a bank called SEDEC Bankers, which is actually in the premises of the Reserve Bank, and therefore through this continuous linked settlement system, all the set of currencies are actually traded through the Reserve Bank, through New York, through commercial banks. And that's what I would like to put some light on because that is really uh, uh, very important to understand the whole topic here. Thanks. All right, just break it down for us with these continuous link systems and you are saying that it is present on uh, the uh, New York Stock Exchange, etc. But what is the benefits to the locals and what is the role of uh, the Reserve Bank in fulfilling the developmental agenda of dealing with inequality, joblessness and unemployment? That's and a problem poverty. because that's a problem because it doesn't help this in general public because it's actually just to the favor of the commercial banks and it's international commercial banks. I mean, the only South African which has a direct account is Standard Bank as far as I know when it didn't change. That means the whole thing was under the uh, guardianship of Tito Mbowini, who you should maybe quiz at some stage. All right, so we're losing you there, Michael. We're going to have to let it go. Michael Dur is a South African Reserve Bank uh, shareholder, uh, joining us via Skype in uh, Germany. And Davos Sheikh Hegwane, National Black Business Caucus CEO. Hegwane, thank you so much for your time. I mean, just in the complexity of the system in itself, and this is something that is... Uh, centuries old, that it had become so sophisticated and refined over the years that Africa will always be dependent on one former colonizer or the other, that today you and I, uh, you know, we, we very little benefit from it besides mm -hmm. the scare tactics that we don't want to be downgraded and mm -hmm. therefore we must behave according to what the markets say. Yes, well, good evening, Sydney. Good evening. Um, and to the viewers, good evening. Um, the issue here is that we do not have fiscal control over, we, we, over our fiscal. We don't have control over fiscal policy, I should say. Um, as you can hear, this elaborate um, 
this elaboration onto the processes that happen behind the scenes that we have we are not privy to as Africans. We we do not have any knowledge of it. It is the first time I hear that. Uh, I do not know anything about the the way that they collude to control and one trillion a day, you know, in dollars that they're trading, including our currency. So basically, we must remain dependent on these systems. And if we ever try to to put our own fiscal policy forward, something that benefits Africans as a whole, then it's scrapped off, and we are going to be downgraded. All these threats and fears. And as um, Sebo Khadima said about the very reason why we need to comply and conform to what the, 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 the rating agencies um, dictate is because we want to borrow money at a lower rate and so on and so forth to pay the principle of a loan that, you know, you know that in, the, in, the, in the, the World Monetary Fund, um, there's a provision there's a law that South Africa has not utilized where any money that was borrowed and utilized in the country that had nothing, no benefit to the, to the people of that country, like the money that was borrowed under apartheid that got us into this debt in the first place, there is a way that we can avoid from paying that money back because it was not borrowed by the free South Africa, it was borrowed by a regime. Yes, but those concessions yes. were made as part of the CODESA and the yes, settlements. But we, yes, but we, instead of paying this money now and finding and, and being, because by owing this money, we are constantly on bended knee to the foreign market, foreign market controllers, right, who make a profit of our debt. We need to go back to that, scrap it, and stop paying that loan because there's a way that we can fix it legally. And it's been accepted before with Cuba, when Cuba and America actually was one of the signatories who forced that um, the Spanish had to take responsibility for the loan that they took when they controlled Cuba. So we, we cannot be now, as South Africans, be very generous and be paying money that we never used, that was not borrowed for our interest, it was not borrowed for us, actually. Mm. I mean, Michael Doe makes the point that, you know, former Reserve Bank governors also need to answer in how we ended up in these... Um, almost, um, you know, we're under ball and chain, so to speak, economically, because we're dependent on the IMF, the World Bank, and they probably own uh, the better part of the, uh, the um, commercial property, etc. Mm -hmm. That it is, it is not benefiting the locals and the needs that are required of just basic dignity, provision mm -hmm. of amenities, etc. How, if we are not knowledgeable about how the system works, are we able to then reshape uh, what the economy needs to look like? It goes back to Codesa. Um, those who educate us have an imperialist mentality. So the, the education that we get is not relevant to understanding such, uh, such detail to both us and the generations that follow us. Also, Codesa, by not changing, you cannot, you cannot adapt an apartheid system. You have to cancel it and start again. So that, that failed because of Cortez. So we have to go back to the roots of the problem and stop trying to trim it as it gets a little bit out of hand here and there. We have to go back to the roots, destroy the roots so that the whole plant doesn't grow again. Okay, well, should you stay, on the, uh, stay with us? I believe mm -hmm. we have Michael Dewar, a Reserve Bank uh, shareholder, uh, back on Skype. But we lost you. If you'll just pick up on your train of thought, saying that we are in the mess we're in because of policies that were adopted by some of the political principalities. Just uh, carry on, Mr. Dewar. Okay. I to talk to uh, uh, the former president to Mr. Suma, and I also was in connection to, uh, to Mr. To His Excellency to Mr. Ramaphosa. Uh, but the thing is that I'm missing a little bit within the ANC the discussion to understand the skaldatories of the Reserve Bank and what is really to the detriment of the population, and that really has to be flushed out. What can be done better in the structures of the Reserve Bank that it's actually better for the country and for the citizens and for the interest rates? Uh, and to understand this, it's really important to understand how the money can get in and out of the country through those foreign exchange transactions, through this continuous linked settlement system, which has been established actually by a person being put there who was a former 
director of the Bank of England and then for a few years a deputy governor of the Reserve Bank by the name of Ian Plenderleith. And he also did the EPSA deal for Barclays. But anyway, I think uh, Tito Mbouwini could shed more light on it as maybe Jill Marcus could do and also Les Echa. But I think this is a very important discussion for the nationalization, for the understanding of the Reserve Bank issue to understand what is really the magnitude of what we are talking about. And I say again, I mean, it's a, it's a magnitude of the South African yearly GDP, which gets traded in a day. And it's not only the South African rand, it's 17 countries, uh, 17 currencies from the SEDEC uh, region, which are traded through Johannesburg and then going to New York, to a financial institution owned by commercial banks, where the Reserve Bank doesn't have any equity. And I think this is a really important issue. All right, Michael, in your view, especially when it comes to benchmarking uh, from other emerging markets, how they got it right in, number one, we were talking about the apartheid debt that was settled in the democratic dis 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 dispensation and the fact that that already created a deficit into the needs of the larger population being met. So how then did other e economies get it right in the less dependence on uh, the IMF and uh, the World Bank? I mean, it's quite, quite tricky because most of them are in the fangs of those uh, supranational institutions. And when you swerve a little out of the way, then you get actually pulled back, like uh, we saw uh, with the discussion which was scheduled for the gov for the parliament and then withdrawn. It's always the same when you come near to the point where it really can uh, get the focus and the light and shed the light on it that you can discuss it and change it to the better then it gets dispersed you know and then it actually gets distracted i mean i don't i can't now get to any country which i would name which made it right i mean you can look at singapore they did a good job but that's a different regime because it was kind of a um, a dictatorship or a, led by a very strong big man. Af when we talk in African language, it was a big man for long. But I mean, there are not many countries who really came from a developmental state to a really uh, uh, industrial state or a G20 or G10 nation. All right, besides being uh, the uh, rate credit rating agencies and their value in the um, w where they would pitch the, a particular country, this essentially is to enable you to borrow at a much less uh, interest rate as opposed to uh, necessarily advancing economic growth. What is your view on rating agencies? Uh, are you talking to me? Oh, sorry, you lost me. Yes, I'm saying what is your view generally on credit rating agencies? Um, the problem is that we have a monopoly of a few and uh, even the Chinese didn't get around to get one properly established. I mean, it's, it's uh, a difficult situation because you're dependent on the Anglo-American uh, Anglo uh, establishments like Moody's, Fitch and Standard and & Poor's. And even the Europeans didn't get it properly, even when the French didn't want to, uh, wanted to do it and the Germans also put in money. It's really difficult to get against those few leading rating agencies. And how uh, you can actually tackle it, I don't have a clue because uh, even China was not uh, really 100% successful. I mean, but rating agencies are there because they grade the bonds, they grade actually the the credit risk, and that's actually important for the financial markets. Therefore, there's a need for rating agencies, but I think there must be more rating agencies and there must be more competition because it's too much of a monopoly. All right, Michael Joe, South African Reserve Bank shareholder live in Germany. Thanks indeed for your time. And we'll continue in studio with Mr. Voshe Gwane, National Black Business Caucus CEO. Uh, in, in the lack of know-how, in, in, even in the struggle and the battle of wanting to have a piece of the economic pie, that there are certain mechanisms and that are entrenched in history that mm -hmm. prevents us or that preclude us from achieving that. So how far does this then take the radical economic transformation um, uh, policy back, Volcher, if, if we can't agree on whether the Reserve Bank is going to be nationalized and if you do, there are certain uh, limitations with, uh, with the law? Um, you know, this problem is a lot wider than just the Reserve Bank. It, it's uh, the radical economic transformation issue for it to become implementable. Um, as you can see, the, the, the commercial banks are behind the scenes and making the big money. 
trading so much money per day, you know, at the expense of the country. I mean, it's not only the local banks. He says only one of our banks is actually involved in that cartel, and it's a lot of international banks. So this system is a lot bigger than what we're looking at here. And you will find that even when we try to implement something and we say, okay, we want to have a something that can a fund that can assist startup black businesses and so on and so forth risk comes up you know we have 50 billion rands of stock fell sitting in the four major banks but any one of those stock fell members if they try to go and get a loan they're called risky you know the banks in south africa i mean a lot of these things you might say a lot of people will say conspiracy theory or whatever but the fact is we deal with this on a daily basis it's easier for a black person to get a loan for a car um but to get a loan for a, for a house gets a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. To get a loan for a business, totally out. So if you want to develop yourself or other people, it's always hurdles in front of you. But to get yourself into debt is easily done. Debt that we are, you know, the, the bank, the bank, if, if they look at you, the commercial banks, if they look at you maybe succeeding or maybe failing, there's a 50% chance of you gaining something. They know with a car or a motorbike, you're definitely not going to get anything out of it, but they're still willing to do that first. And that shows you that we need a, we need a, a total paradigm shift in, in Africa about what we want to achieve. And this dependency on the West is also a figment of our imagination. We are the financiers of the first world countries. Without us, if Africa was to close all its gates now and say we're not sending out a single mineral out of Africa, the New York Stock Exchange, the, the NASDAQ, all of them will collapse overnight because it's us who are funding the, the, the survival of those economies. But isn't it that we sold our birthright, so to speak, uh, you know, in the interest of not being able to extract the minerals, not having the technology, etc. That, But I get your point. But let's get mm. come back to what... Finance Minister Dandanen is saying that uh, the trajectory of the economy looks good. The rating agencies are happy with the budget uh, speech, and uh, that uh, the only, f you know, we need to translate that into more foreign direct investment. Again, we're running on a dependency. You know, we are impressing the foreign. You know, we have this mentality that everything must be right according to those who oppress us. You know, we must conform to the West. We live in Africa, we're not in America. So what America thinks should really not be, I know people say you are economically, you know, not, not well connected economically, that's why you're saying this. But the fact is, as Africa, we have enough within our own borders that if we are to build our own fiscal policy and our own investment policy and our own development policies that are independent to the rest of the world, they'll still need to do business with us because we have the minerals, we have the raw resources, we have the, the basic foundation of an economy. So while we are dependent on them, we'll always have to conform to them. That's why we can't even have a discussion. He's a shareholder in the Reserve Bank. And he's saying that that's the reason why it was pulled back from a discussion in parliament, because the foreign powers that make money of the current status quo do not want it changed. We want it changed. We live in tin shacks. We live in places where water doesn't run. We live in places where there's no electricity. We want the system to change to be able to support us in our Africa. So why do we always put first what the West thinks? Hmm. I mean, it's even more glaring based on what Michael Doy, he's one of the majority shareholders um, in the Reserve Bank, hmm. in the sense that the very South African Reserve Bank is not representative in the hmm. foreign indices where the currencies of over 18 um, uh, countries in Africa are hmm. trading and benefiting largely their, their um, investors as opposed to uh, yes. bringing the money back into those areas. So essentially what he's saying is that we are yet again a conduit for profit to somebody else at the detriment of not only us but every other set of country that's around us that's outrageous and we have leaders who meet um, at SADC meetings at African Union and they do not change this and I do not know why they need to change these kind of issues because within Africa if we focus our efforts internally I'm telling you that we can be the we are the greatest continent on the planet because we've got all the wealth but we're not utilizing any of that wealth. It's being utilized by third parties who do not care about our development here. So who's looking after the person here who hasn't got dinner to eat tonight, whose children are going home to sleep hungry? Yet billions are being dug out of our, our minds and going to, to feed another country's child so they can sleep with a full belly. 
That's outrageous. African leaders need to grow up, get strong, and deal with this issue. Yeah, but uh, also the, the lack of competition within the big three uh, credit rating agencies is, uh, uh, puts anyone at a disadvantage, especially governments that are already heavily indebted, that need to have uh, investment in their development projects, construction or building uh, ho houses, etc. That mm. It's not a situation that can just... You, you can't just divorce yourself of them. You need yes. to, to, to woo them and uh, give some indication of stability. Yes, we do. In the current status quo, we do. You cannot ignore them because they control a lot of what we depend on because of the systems we chose to utilize. But it's not necessarily because those same agents, they're the same ones who destroyed the, world, the global economy in 2008, 2009. They're the same ones who rated toxic loans at triple A rating. So why are they still so believed? If it was an African, if I was hitting a, a, an agency and then I did that 2008, 2009, even today my credibility would be down. But because they're Americans and they've, they've got good systems over hundreds of years that were created to constantly steal from Africa, they, they just continue down that line. And this is what's happening outside of our shores. We as Africans have got to learn how everybody is utilizing us, how we are conduits for people's development. All those countries, you know, they, some of them, they're, they're struggling. They look like they're strong countries, but they're struggling in many ways. And they need Africa to maintain their status quo. So they maintain this status quo here. We cannot do that. As Africans, we have to put an end to this. We have to find another way. I appreciate you and thank you so much uh, for those sobering thoughts. And that's for Shia Khekwane, National Black uh, Business Caucus CEO, joining us live in studio.